الحمد لله لا أبغي به بدلا حمدا يبلغ من رضوانه الأمل ثم الصلاة على خير الورى وعلى ساداتنا آله وصحبه الفضلاء الحمد لله الذي علم علمنا القرآن ثم أتم هذه نعمة ببعث سيد الأكوان الذي دعنا إلى الجنان اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه في الأولين وفي الآخرين وفي المرء الأعلى يا رب العالمين يا أيها الذين آمروا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس تقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيْكُمْ رَقِيبًا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا تَقُوا اللَّهَ وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا يُصْلِحْ لَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَمَنْ يُتَعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا أما بعد إن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم شر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار الله سبحانه وتعالى in different places in the Quran he mentions worship and in fact in an infinite number of contexts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, After I would be laying in a shaitan regime, Wama Kharako to Jinna or Insa Illa Yabu Hudun. Ma Uridu Minhum Rispin, Wama Uridu and Yupayu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I have not created jinn and human beings except to worship me. I do not request any provisions from them, nor do I request that they feed me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is caught in the nafs, free of all needs, al summon. We find in, in the Quran something very interesting that worship is so important that it is one of the few commands which is directed to all people, not just the Muslims, as a reminder to all people to center them on their purpose. Allah SWT says, Ya ayyuhal nasu abudu rabbakum ulladhi khalaqakum. Oh, you who believe, worship your Lord. Oh, oh, people, excuse me. Worship your Lord. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he wanted to honor the Prophet وسلم, he would do so in the context of the Prophet being a devotee to Allah, a worshiper of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, in the beginning of the 17th chapter of the Quran, he says, Subhanallah asra bi abdihi. Transcendent is the one who took his abd. He didn't say Nabihi or Bi Muhammadin or Bi Rasulihi alayhi salatu salam. He said Bi Abdi. And when he mentioned the trials and, and the tribulations that the Prophet faced, when his religious freedoms and the religious freedoms of his fledgling community were being threatened, and the Prophet وسلم, stayed resilient. Allah describes him عَبَدًا إِذَا صَلَّى That Prophet is the Abd of Allah. So worship is something very important. We find in the Quran mentioned an infinite number of situations through pain, through success, through sorrow, through fear. And then the honorifics given to the Prophet are usually at their most explicit when there is a clear designation provided by Allah of the Prophet وسلم, as a servant of Allah. But worship is not easy. Allah says, وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ That to be someone of reverence in salah is difficult. If that's the case of salah, where we don't have to deal with all of the haram combos and the bundles of haram that we find ourselves sometimes surrounded with in society, then how much more difficult it is to be a worshiper outside of salah. If it's hard in salah, or make the adhan 
Shaitan is gone. The Mithi Kakama. Shaitan is gone again. Is gone again. The only thing I'm left to is myself. And even in Salah, I can say it for myself. It's hard not to like think about my 401k. Then what about outside of Salah? So what I want to talk today about is one of the easiest ways we can set our course that will allow us to live a life of devotion and meaning and the ibadah so that we fulfill our purpose. This purpose is so great that the hadith of Sahih Muslim, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, La taqumu sa'ah, the hour will not start until Allah's name is no longer mentioned. Why? Because when Allah's name is no longer mentioned by the muqallafin, by human beings, then the purpose of creation is done. Because the purpose of creation was worship. So hence the hour starts. The first thing is that we don't actually have a lot of time for worship. Even if we live to be 100 years old. Most of the students that I met this week have all said the exact same thing to the point that now I'm able to say to them, I know what you're about to say to me. And they're like, man, I can't believe it's midtime. I can't believe half of the semester is already over. I actually felt the same way. I said to Khaled, we were sitting, I said, it's already halfway. But that's how we will feel when we die. And we see the infiniteness of the hereafter compared to the shortness of this dunya. Hopefully we will not be those people who say, ya ya Like I wish. I could go back and change things. And one of the beauties of Islam is that it causes us to focus our attention to Allah. It's one of the things that attracted me to Allah. And to this relationship with Allah. And this devotion to Allah. And understanding that if I'm not worshiping Allah, I'm going to worship something else. If I don't surrender to Allah, it's in my nature. I'll surrender to something else. If I don't live a life of purpose and meaning that's rooted in the infinite, I'll undoubtedly be unfulfilled and shallow and empty. That's why when Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, when he embraced al-Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the verse, أَوَمَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا فَأَحْيَيْنَاهُ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا يَمْشِي بِهِ The one who was dead, we brought him to life. He wasn't physically dead, but internally he was dead. He felt empty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him and brought him to life. With There's two things we can do that will allow us to live our life for a greater purpose, to emancipate ourselves from catching up with the Kardashians. Listen to what Travis Scott's talking about. You know, losing my mind if I don't get the new Call of Duty. You know, if the certain things don't work out in my life, I didn't get into this grad school. Undoubtedly, some of those things, especially the last one, are things that should upset us, but they shouldn't own us. And that's what Imam Ibn Ajiba, he says that one of the highest maqam of a believer is maqam al huriya It's the station of emancipation. Where someone is free from some of the negative currents of the temporary world. They're brave when it comes to the truth. What's the first thing, alhamdulillah, that we can do? Is to realize that Islam has come with a very simple purpose. After worship. It's the primary purpose. Everything else falls under worship. Worship is so important that the Prophet Sallallahu said to Mu'ad, Do you know if people worship Allah alone, what is the reward? Say to Mu'ad, he said, I don't know. The Prophet said, Allah will not punish them. And in Jannah, when Allah speaks to the people of Jannah, he doesn't say people who have Gucci, people that are wearing Fendi, 
people that are at the Met Gala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yeah, Ibad. They fulfilled this, this, this covenant. We ask Allah to make us from those people. The first is that we should understand Islam has a very, very beautiful message. But when people ask me, what does it mean to be Muslim? It, says, it means for you to reach your potential in the right way. It's for you to achieve who you want to be, but for the right reasons. And that is, if we look at the text of the Quran, and the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in Usul al Fiqh, we have something called Istiqra al Nusus. Which means that there's a survey of the text to find the broader themes of Kuliyat, those universal principles of Islam. We find this very beautiful idea that is shared by scholars across the spectrum. Al-Baqilani, Imam Haramain, Al-Ghazali, Al-Razi, Imam Shalkani, Imam Al-Shatibi, you name it. They came to this conclusion. What Yazidin Abdul Salam said is the great objective after worship is to bring benefit and prevent harm. That's your deen. Jalb al Masarih or Dar al Mafas. We taught a course about this last year. We taught Izzi Adin's, Izzi Adin Abdul Salam's book on the greater good. Sayyidina Imam, Sayyidina Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, in explaining the Quran in a, in a more thematic way. He says that if you look at every verse that says, Ya ayyuhalladina ama, and you go home, try this out. Oh, you who believe, he says you find one of two things either a command for you to bring something beneficial as a believer, or a prohibition that's keeping you from harm. Yani amr bi tahsil and maslaha, a command to achieve what's good. Or a nahi an al hasad or munkarat, or a prohibition to keep us from harm or darar and evil. So, for example, take any verse. Ya yu ladina amanu, kutiba alaykum usiyam, kama kutiba ala ladina mil kabarikum la alakum fatakun. O faithful people, deliberate Muslims, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was those before you, so you will achieve taqwa. So bring a benefit. The fifth chapter of the Quran. Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, O believers, la tas'alu, don't ask about stuff. In tubadala kum tasukum, if it's made known to you, it will harm you. So over and over you see this pattern. A command that brings benefit, or prohibition that protects from harm. Because of course the greatest success, فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَلِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةِ فَقَدْ فَازِ Whoever enters Jannah has truly succeeded. And escape the hell has truly been protected. The Prophet وسلم, is described in this way in Surah Al Saba. Allah SWT says about him, وسلم, We sing you, O Muhammad, with what people need, what is needed for all people. That's actually a very important message. At this age in life, where so many things at times can be a little ambiguous. And by the way, that doesn't go away. It stays with you till, till we die. But imagine being able to tie yourself to this idea of making benefit and preventing harm in any situation that you and that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to the Sahaba that there is a tree in the desert and it is like a believer. So teach me. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is an engaging teacher. It's not a one-way street. He said, so tell me, what do you think it is? Alayhi salatu was salam. And there, there begin to be this discussion amongst them. What it is this or this or this or this. And Abdullah ibn Umar said, فَوَقَعَ فِي نَفْسِ أَنْهَا نَخْلَةً Abdullah ibn Umar said, you know, I knew it was the date tree. 
but stuff he too, like I was shy to say anything because I was young. And then afterwards, the Prophet told him it's the date tree. Commenting on this Imam Ibn Hajar, he says something very beautiful. Why the date tree is similar to the believer, he said, because in our culture, he's talking about he lived, of course, in Egypt, that in our time, the most beneficial tree is the date tree. We use its bark for our homes. We use it, its leaves for our sajadas and our curtains. We use its water. Now you can get really expensive date water, some like hipster stores. And we eat what's now known as the one of the superfoods, dates. What he said is that this happens all season. That there are so many, if those of you who've been overseas, you know, there's like balah, right? There's like, you see it now in the streets here, yellow dates in Harlem, the best, mashallah. You have the dry dates, the wet drinks. So all season, it's possible to take benefit from this tree. And he says, well, how can move? That's the believer, no matter where they are, at work, at home, at school. They're like this date tree that brings benefit, alhamdulillah, and prevent harm. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us through our careers, through our education, which is very important to us, our plans for the future, to make sure that we tie that idea to the greater idea of worship with the intention of bringing benefit and preventing harm. That's Allah Azza wa Jalla and Yuwafiqana wa Iyakum. Aqulu qawli kata astaghfir Allah hari wa lakum fastaghfiru innahu wa ghafuruhi. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا ومولانا رسول الله على آله وأصحابه ومن وله. We praise Allah subhanahu wa taala. We send peace and blessings upon the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, upon his blessed family, his companions, and those who follow them. It's a very inspirational religion, ما شاء الله. Islam is a transformative faith. It's something that allows us to constantly think about how we're growing, how we're developing. But there's one more thing that's very important in all of this, and this is moderation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, after, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, وَكَذَارِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ غَصُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا That we have made you wasata, an ummah that is Balanced. Any irrational conservatism, irresponsible liberalism, not in the political, of course, but in the general, you find Islam. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, The best of affairs are those that are balanced. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, to say, he said, there's a time for this and a time for that. It's interesting that that verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, I heard from Sheikh Abdul Hamid Al-Azhari when I was reading to him years ago, that describes us as the moderate community, not the subjective moderate. We mean the sunnah. The sunnah is the epitome of moderation. Because we know people like to, I was asked recently by someone in the press, like, what is a moderate Muslim? Is like the Prophet Muhammad This verse is verse 143 in Surah Al-Baqarah. But subhanAllah, Surah Al-Baqarah is 286 verses. So if we divide 286 by, mashallah, 2, 142. So even the, the setting up of the verses is subhanAllah miraculous. But Sayyidina Hudayfa, he was young. And he felt the pressure that sometimes when we, we can be our own worst enemies, we become harder on ourselves than we need to. We may make religion harder than it really is or easier than it really is, but oftentimes it's the case will make it much more difficult. And that's actually one of the tricks of shaitan. Ibn Qayyim said, for every order and command of Allah, there's a shaitan who tries to get someone to be too hard on themselves so they hate the religion or too lax so they, there's no religion left. 
there's no vestiges of religion left. So that moderate path is important. How do we achieve that? Asking the ulama, having first and foremost a relationship with the Quran, Quranic literacy, studying the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, taking our deen from qualified people, asking questions. But this narration of Hudayfa, I think, is important for you because maybe nowadays you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself. You got to take it a little easy. You got midterms. It's hard. It's a lot of plates on the bar right now. You were just doing some simple calisthenics. And then suddenly you looked up and it was like 645s on both sides of the bar. And then you're like, man, I can't come to the haraka. I'm such a bad Muslim. Oh man, I struggle sometimes to get my prayers. I'm going to hell. But at least I'll be an engineer. That kind of pressure happens. And that's one of the tricks of shaitan. And that's why it's important. Imams and sheikh and ulama, their job is to be like textbook. Keep you balanced. Sayyidina Hudayfa came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah. And he actually know the narration. He was walking in the streets and saying, Hudayfa is destroyed. Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he saw him, عنه, and he said to him, like, why are you saying that about yourself? Now the narration, he said, I'm a hypocrite. But Sayyidina Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, he said, Taqila, fear Allah. Like, why would you say that? Don't be self-deprecating. He said, because, you know, when I'm with the Messenger of Allah, I feel like, mashallah, I'm ready to do everything good. But then I go home and I have, like, my responsibilities. And I feel like that, that high is gone. So my iman must not be sincere. Look at the humility of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is not on social media nowadays. If someone wrote that on social media, there would at least be 455 million comments. Telling Hudayfa either he was okay, he was the worst person in the world, he left Islam, he was the wali of Allah. I mean, it would be like the whole entire gamut would be there, right? And Hudayfa would be confused. Abu Bakr, with all his knowledge, what does he do? Let's go to the Prophet. Like Sayyidina Umar, when Jibreel, when the Prophet said, Atadri Manis Say, do you know who that was? Oh no. He didn't say, yeah, you know, maybe it was this person or maybe it was this. I have this really cool idea. I thought I had a dream. He's like, I don't know. Humility is what made that humility incredible. So Abu Bakr takes Sayyidina Hudayfa to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Hudayfa complains about the situation and the Prophet says to him, this is rare. Like what you're seeking for is very rare. It's very difficult, almost impossible. There's a time for this, there's a time for that. And there's a time for you to handle things in your life, and there's a time for you to have this dedication on the specific needs of your community. So I just want to encourage you to study hard. I'll give you some fiqh issues that may help you, but don't get me in trouble. It's allowed to join your prayers in the face of need according to the Maliki school and the Hanbali school. This is the stronger opinion because the hadith of Sayyidina Say ibn Abbas related by Imam al-Tirmidhi, that the Prophet that the Prophet joined prayers without grain, without travel, without sickness. Although both men have said this is not something done all the time within the Sunni tradition, of course. Because of Salat ala waqtih. So maybe you find yourself you're stuck studying. You got a lot of pressure. Exams, whatever. You need to join Asr and Zuhr. It's okay. Maghrib and Isha, it's okay. As long as we don't start as people who follow the Sunni fiqh, doing this all the time. There are, mashallah, dispensations for these situations. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from his ibad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us be on the path of moderation. If you look in the Muslim world now, the ulama who are in prison are not the radicals. On the left or the right, it's who? People in the middle. Noam Chomsky said that whenever people were targeted in the occupied territories for leadership, it was always the moderate leaders. 
is they will have the biggest impact on people. So we see people like Sheikh Salman al awla in prison. We should ask ourselves, what did he do to anybody? But again, those people in the middle tend to pose the biggest challenge. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us be people of balance, inshallah, on the sunnah of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us sincere in our worship and our devotion and directing our lives to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to bless all of you as you go through this important time in your life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to facilitate any difficulties that you may be experiencing academically. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you emotionally at a very vulnerable time as well, to surround you with strong and positive reinforcement. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unite us with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as we believe in him even though we don't see him. Alayhi salatu we ask Allah to bless our parents and our family. As we finish, inshallah, after we're done praying, there will be um, Shia brothers and sisters are going to be praying here in the back. So after namaz, uh, salah, if we can pray our sunnahs and quickly kind of exit, I'm sure that would be appreciated. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fi la akhira fi hasana, wa kina ala bin nar. Subhanahu rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamu ala muhsani wa alhamdulillah.